This week on Christian World News, tensions high in the Middle East. Israel strikes back after Iran's massive attack. What comes next? Plus, a miracle of biblical proportions as hundreds of drones and missiles rain down on Israel. God spread his wings of protection over the Jewish state. Plus, in Sudan, a year of civil war, millions of people are displaced and millions more are in need of food. The country's Christians are among those obviously hardest hit. Hello everyone, welcome to this week's edition of Christian World News. I'm George Thomas. And welcome back, George. I'm Wendy Griffith. Well, a dangerous game in the Middle East as Israel and Iran exchange attacks. Israel retaliated less than a week after Iran unleashed a massive air assault against the Jewish state. Some believe Israel's strike was designed to respond to Iran's aggression without sparking a wider regional war. Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem. The Iranian Tasneem news agency reported the assault took place in the southeastern part of the city near its nuclear energy mountain. Isfahan is the site of one of Iran's major nuclear sites, enriching uranium for Iran's nuclear program. According to the Jerusalem Post, the attack on Isfahan was carried out with long-range missiles launched from aircraft, not drones or land-air missiles. An Iranian official told Reuters, there is no plan for an immediate response. It is not clear who is behind the attack. An Iranian TV anchor downplayed the attack and quoted a military official in Isfahan. Uh, he did uh, confirm that uh, there were some uh, loud sounds that were heard in the east of the city of Isfahan. And this was related to the air defense system, as uh, we told you and our viewers before, uh, triggered by the presence of uh, three small drones uh, that were present in that area. On local television, other reporters near the area showed how quiet and normal Isfahan looks. Middle East expert Avi Melaman told CBN News Iran seems to be minimizing the story on purpose. Yona Bob, Jerusalem Post military correspondent and author of the book Target Tehran, told CBN News the strike sends a clear message. The message behind the strike from Israel was, Iran, you cannot do what you did last weekend. You attacked Israel directly. You attacked with 350 aerial threats. 170 drones, 120 ballistic missiles, 30 cruise missiles. That cannot happen again. If it does, you will suffer and you will suffer large. Bob also says the attack was calibrated to avoid a regional war and represents a crossroads to Israel and Iran. This is a unique moment. There was a shadow war between Israel and Iran that we talk about in our book, Target Tehran, for a long time. The question now is, Will we go back to that shadow war, or has the paradigm been crushed? And even though Israel isn't officially taking credit for what happened today, will there be additional direct exchanges between Iran and Israel? We will only know that going forward. Meanwhile, some analysts are saying that Israel's response was measured, only enough to give an answer to the Iranian attack. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Thank you, Chris. Well, George, you are just back from Israel. Yeah. What's the sense there are people fearing there will be a wider war with Iran? Uh, I mean, I think that possibility is there, but a, a war with Iran directly? I don't think so, because on, Oct on April 14th, uh, Iran basically threw at Israel all of its best equipment, um, military hardware. We're talking about 120 ballistic missiles, 30 cruise missiles, 170 drones. This is the best that Iran has. And Israel managed to intercept 99% of them. Israelis are, are, are breathing a sigh of relief that its technology, its air defense capability that it's been refining and honing for such a long time worked to perfection. Yeah. And today, Israelis are obviously very, very thankful for that. It, it, we felt like we were witnessing a miracle when we yeah, were yeah, all definitely, watching that. Yeah, for sure. Um, George, how should Christians be praying right now, not only for Israel, yeah. but also for the people of Iran? I, I think in the next couple of 
days, perhaps after Passover, we will see a major military operation inside of Gaza. There is absolutely all indications is that the Israelis, the IDF, are going to go into Rafah. They're going to clean out Hamas and then potentially turn their sights on Hezbollah. We need to pray for the IDF, for the Netanyahu government, but also in Iran. What I'm hearing from people inside the country, they don't want this war with, uh, with Israel. They are not happy at all with the Islamic regime. Again, again, I cannot uh, emphasize more that this is not a war against Iran. It is a war against the Islamic regime. Yeah. Uh, it's the mullahs, not the Iranians. All right, George, thank you so much. We're glad you're back safe with Thanks. us. Well, for updates on this story, be sure to check the website, cbnnews.com. Well, some are calling Israel's protection from Iran's massive attack, as you mentioned just a few seconds ago uh, last week, a modern miracle on the world stage. Chris Mitchell sat down with Rabbi Yitzhak Adderstein to talk about God's hand of protection over the Jewish nation. Rabbi Yitzhak Adlerstein, great to be with you again. Great to be back. Yeah, tell us uh, April 13th or into the 14th, what do you believe happened? I, I believe that we were all witness to nothing short of a miracle of biblical proportions. I think it's going to take a little while for the, the full effect of it, for the facts to set in. But it wasn't, hey, the IDF was really successful with the aid of our allies, and Israel survived, even though there was stuff coming in all over the country, literally. 99% of the projectiles coming in, drones and missiles, were, were, were shot down. There was minimal property damage and one, one serious injury in a Bedouin village. Now, how, how do you account for that? You know, um, when, the, when the Jews left uh, Egypt, Passover, which we're on the verge of, um, you had the really great Cecil B. DeMille moments, the 10 plagues, the crossing of the Red Sea. But you know, what happened after that? What happened in the aftermath? There were two countries, both had experienced the same thing. They had witnessed the same thing. But the Israelites went on to Sinai to accept the Torah and make a new covenant with God. The Egyptians went right back to where they were before. This is always what happens with miracles. The believer understands that this is the hand of God. And the non-believer finds some way of accounting for it. No, I don't know, we'll figure it out. We'll kick it down the road a couple of centuries. Somebody will explain it. There's, there's no way to make a believer out of miracles. But for those of us who believe in God's hand in history, how could you not see that this was the hand of God protecting his land? In any kind of conflict, give credit to the IDF, but there's always human error. There are always things that get through. You know, the friendly fire casualties in Gaza have been some of the highest in recorded armed conflict, because we're fighting in urban territory, 20 percent, they feel. But it's not just restricted to, to Gaza. When you're, when you're out there shooting down those things, it's just so easy for one, two, three to get through, but not a single one. How do you account for that? And that enemies of Israel joined the fight? Yes, they had their political interests. It's true. The Iranians have been trying to unseat the king of Jordan and install mm -hmm. a Shiite presence in, 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 in their country. But still, to have the active assistance of the United States, Great Britain, Saudi Arabia, now yesterday conceded that, yes, they were actively helping, and, and Jordan, that's a small miracle. The bigger miracle is the degree to which Israel was spared. We were all at 2 o'clock in the morning sitting there waiting for the, for the onslaught. And we went down to the bomb shelters. Hey, what are we doing here? Nothing's happening. And a few minutes later, you all clear, we come out and we watch this fireworks show like no 4th of July that I've ever experienced. Just watching those incoming lights take down the, 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 the missiles that were aimed at us. So you know, this is my passion right now, to, to Jew, to non-Jew, to anyone who believes in God and believes that 
Yisrael, the God of Israel does not slumber or sleep. That this is what we saw. And it doesn't mean the end of the war. It doesn't mean that God isn't somehow still, who knows what he has in store for us. But you know, even in the midst of tragedy, God has a habit of sending these little notes. I know you can't figure out the bigger picture and what's going on, but I just want to reassure you, I haven't gone any place. I'm still with you. That's what we live for. Amen. Well, up next, churches burned and missionaries forced to flee one year since Sudan's civil war began. Its impact on the country's tiny Christian community when we come back. Welcome back to Christian World News. The war-torn African nation of Sudan is on the verge of a humanitarian crisis. One year since civil war broke out, nearly 18 million people, including 14 million children, face hunger. Eight million people are displaced, and thousands of schools and hospitals are out of operation. Sudan's tiny Christian community has been hit hard. More than 150 churches have been destroyed, and many missionaries and other workers forced to flee the communities they serve. Tina Ramirez is founder and president of Hardwired Global, a group that serves the church in Sudan. She joins me now for more. Tina, great to have you back on the broadcast. Can you describe the conditions uh, right now in Sudan? Yeah, thank you for having me. Just uh, last week, we were doing programs for uh, our organization Hardwired, which promotes religious freedom around the world in uh, Juba in South Sudan. And it's, uh, you know, in talking with the Christian leaders there, there's, uh, it was a gathering of college leaders from universities, Christian college leaders from across uh, South Sudan. Um, all of them are deeply troubled by what's happening in the North because you really can't separate what's happening in Khartoum from the rest of uh, Sudan or South Sudan. Um, the countries are so intertwined uh, with their histories and the people and their and their families. And in, in Sudan, as your colleague mentioned, millions of people have been displaced, have had to flee. Tens of thousands have been killed. Um, and for the churches in particular in the North, um, it's been extremely hard because they're some of the poorest of the poor. They don't have um, you know any representation really in the country uh, that can speak for them politically, and so they have just been surviving. And um, churches have been attacked; they've been used as as um, as barracks for the military operations. Many people have died within the churches. Um, it's just extremely frightening. Never before have uh, the Christians in Sudan seen this kind of fighting in Khartoum. It's happened in the Nuba Mountains and in Darfur and all over the country. But for it to come right into the heart of the city where the, the majority of the population is, mm. has just uh, completely uprooted everybody. And um, I mean, the, the church is just displaced all over the country and even outside of the country right now. Uh, Tina, why is there a lack of uh, international aid and what needs to be done to change the narrative? Well, I think that the failure in Sudan, as in South Sudan, occurred a long time ago. This is nothing new. Um, the United States uh, was very interested in Sudan. I actually first was involved and first traveled to S Sudan um, as a congressional staffer for the U.S. Congress, helping to move forward the comprehensive peace agreement negotiations uh, back in 2007. And that led ultimately to the secession of South Sudan. Um, but since the secession of South Sudan, I think there was a false sense of peace between the two countries. And since then, Obviously, um, Omar al-Bashir was overthrown in 2019. Uh, my company had been training leaders in Khartoum since 2013 uh, to, to help rebuild the country and fight for religious freedom in the Constitution. But there's a sense internationally, I think, of fatigue um, in Sudan because of the long war. There is a false sense of hope. Um, you know, unfortunately, there's there's this misnomer that somehow just because you have election, you're somehow now a de democracy, and that's just not the case. And military rulers... Um, and strongmen, um, with with them in power, there's never going to be peace. And so working and trying to negotiate them has always been a failure of foreign policy, um, both for the United States and around the world. And that's what happened even with the fall of Omar al-Bashir in the north. We've seen that even in South Sudan when um, the South seceded, it, it devolved into a civil war, into chaos. You, you, the, uh, this idea that you can transition from military rule to civilian rule is something that we need to reconsider and really take seriously because the people of Sudan are suffering now. Uh, the, the situation there, um, there will be no peace without a ceasefire, without serious peace and reconciliation, um, without an international force that's going to, to enforce these, um, these values of democracy and freedom that the people of Sudan had fought so hard for. 
So yeah. it's very tenuous right now. Yeah, uh, real quickly, I know this is not a war between Muslims and Christians. Primarily it's between Muslims and Muslims, but Christians have really taken uh, a beat and you said about 150 churches. Why are they targeting Christians, real quickly? Well, Christians have always been the primary target because they really threaten the ideology um, of the government, which hasn't changed really because um, it was just, you know, Omar al-Bashir was just replaced by military strongmen who were part of the genocide that occurred against Christians. Uh, over two million Christians were killed just in the South alone and um, compare that to a couple hundred thousand Muslims in Darfur. So people often, I think because of the situation in Darfur that's gotten so much attention, forget that it was 10 times as many Christians that were targeted and killed by the RSF, by these this um, Darfur a militia that's mm -hmm. now trying to buy for power in the country. So Christians um, are a public enemy to the government. They always have been. Um, they're seen as a threat uh, because of the uh, just the military leaders yeah. that are Islamist and, and want to destroy them yeah. and Tina, see them as their power. Yeah, Tina, sorry, we have to cut you short there. Th uh, thank you so much for coming on the broadcast. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Wendy? Coming up, he's written eight books that top the New York Times bestseller list. His latest story is about a nighttime escape from Haiti, except this one is completely true. about news. As the head of a faith-based ministry, acclaimed writer Mitch Album has visited Haiti many times over the last decade. Recently, it's become more dangerous as violent gangs have taken over the capital city, Port-au-Prince. His most recent trip was nearly his final one. Take a look. New York Times bestselling author, columnist, playwright, and screenwriter Mitch Albom has sold over 41 million books, two of which were made into award-winning TV movies. Most known for Tuesdays with Maury, the best-selling memoir of all time, Mitch has also written several other bestsellers, like his latest work of fiction, The Little Liar. In addition to writing, Mitch is also a humanitarian. After the devastating earthquake hit Haiti in 2010, Mitch has operated Have Faith Haiti, an orphanage in Port-au-Prince that provides a loving home where children can thrive. Mitch Album joins us now for more. Mitch, if you can give us the short version, how did a best-selling author become the head of an orphanage in Haiti? By accident. Uh, it was uh, 2010, the earthquake. I went down with a pastor who had an orphanage there that he thought had been destroyed. I just went to sort of take a look, and it hadn't been destroyed, thank God. And oh. I kind of fell in love with the kids and started bringing down people from Detroit to build the first showers, the first toilets, the first kitchen, the first school. Wow. And eventually the pastor there said, well, I don't have any money to run this place. I'm in my 80s. And I kind of blurted out, well, I could probably run this place if you want me to. How hard could it be? And <laughs> he said, all yours. And uh, he was gone. And I've been running it ever since and been there every, every month ever since. Well, it's called the Half Faith Haiti Mission and Orphanage. Yeah. Uh, describe the role that faith plays in helping these kids uh, live and thrive. Well, faith is behind everything at our orphanage, uh, particularly in Haiti, where you need a lot of it. You know, it's the second poorest country in the world. Uh, right now it's fraught with violence and our kids haven't been out of the orphanage in, in three years. They literally can't go outside. Wow. Uh, our kids pray uh, not only for every meal, but every night. The most beautiful thing is they have devotion, 40, 45 minutes of just pure singing and joy uh, and thanking the Lord. Even though all their possessions fit in a 12 inch by 12 inch cubby, mm -hmm. all their songs and prayers are, are thanks. So um, I think in a country like Haiti, you need faith uh, yeah. to get through because otherwise it can be pretty grim. Well, as you mentioned, Haiti is in chaos right now. 80% yeah. of the capital, Port-au-Prince, is controlled by violent gangs. Yeah. Uh, what is life like for people living in this situation? It's almost unimaginable. Uh, imagine not being able to go outside your doors. Imagine every night hearing gunfire, and I don't mean like a random shot, but like that, yeah. hearing about bodies being found in the street, being burned and left, uh, cadavers left out there, food being cut down, no airport, no boats, no cars, no way to literally get out of the country or into the country. That's what Haiti is on a daily basis today. And Mitch, last month you and 10 volunteers, including two congressmen, had to flee Haiti in the middle of the night. Tell yeah. us about that. Well, we go down every month, as I say, and on this particular trip we brought eight, eight volunteers with us, and yeah. right when we got there, there was a huge prison break-in, and then they shut down the airport, they shut down the ports, and it was very apparent we weren't going to be able to get out. 
uh, and we start to become a target there and draw attention to our orphanage. And so we arranged with Corey Mills and Lisa McLean, two Congress people, not a Congress thing. This was a private endeavor. Yeah. Um, they came in with a helicopter at 3 o'clock in the morning, landed in this secret location, and we just ran in, jumped inside a helicopter within 60 seconds and took off because the gangs would be firing at helicopters. Wow. And, and we prayed that we didn't get shot at and, uh, and flew out. But it was heartbreaking because we had to leave our kids behind who wouldn't have been, even if we could have gotten all of them in the helicopter, wouldn't have been allowed to land anywhere because yeah. Haitians aren't welcome in any of the surrounding countries. Right now, there's no end to this fighting in sight. Yeah. You know, is there hope for these children in Haiti and what can be done to, to bring about change? Well, I believe there's hope always. You can't, you, can't have, you can't live life without hope or without faith. But it will require outside, in, outside intervention. And 80% uh, of the Haitians want that. There are some people who will go around and say, oh, Haitians don't want you to let them figure out their own problems. Not now. They're so violent with the gangs that right now they need outside intervention to quell the gang violence, to at least get everybody you know, back where they can go outside and fuel can start running and people can fly in and out. Then they need free elections uh, and non-corrupt elections. And then they need, in my mind, to make education free for all the children. Right now you have to pay to go to school in Haiti. And that keeps poor people uneducated, which perpetuates the cycle of violence. And, and poverty. Any plans for you to try to go back? Oh, we'll be back as soon as, as soon as we can find airspace. I mean, we yeah. have been there every month of, of my life since for the last 14 years, along with my wife, and we're not stopping now. Uh, as soon as there's a little crack in the, you know, in the violence. opening, we'll be there. Wow. Yeah. Well, thank you for what you're doing. Wow, you God bless you. Uh, MitchAlbum, MitchAlbum.com is the place to go for the or, website. Or HaveFaithHaiti.org for the orphanage, yes. Okay, thank you so much. My pleasure, thank you. You can learn more about the work of the church around the world at our website, cbnnews.com. We'll be back right after this. Finally this week, France's Catholic Church saw a record number of baptisms this Easter. Yeah, it's incredible, actually. According to the Jesuit publication, America, more than 12,000 people were baptized during one Easter service. About 5,000 were teenagers. That's an increase of 31% over last year. The report also says France's Catholic Church has seen a rise in baptism over the last decade, mm. most coming from non-religious families and about 5% from Muslim backgrounds. Fantastic. God moving yeah. all around the world. It's been a, such a season for baptism. Exactly, yeah. Even here in the U.S. That's right. Folks, that is it for this week's edition of Christian World News. It is great to be back. <laughs> Until next week, from all of us here, goodbye. And as always, God bless you. Thank you.